Our third witness uh, for this afternoon is uh, Amanda Holt, uh, who came to fame uh, as the named plaintiff uh, in the action brought against the 2011 Legislative Reapportionment Commission. Uh, he has not said this to me directly, uh, but I think Senator Costa, who also was a litigant in that case, wonders how you became so famous when <laughs> Costa alphabetically comes before Holt. He thinks he should have had that glory. Her arguments uh, are much more persuasive than mine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but uh, that moment has come and gone. Uh, we're very glad you're here today, grateful to you for making the trip in, and I will turn the floor over to you. And I appreciate you having me here. I was thinking, um, it was in June of 2011, I sat in this very seat, perhaps this very seat if they're in the same order, and spoke to my first um, commission and gave testimony, and that time was the State Government Committee on Congressional Districts. And all of you were participating in the process as well 10 years ago, and we are all still here today for some reason. <laughs> Interested still in this process, and interested in the citizens of Pennsylvania and really caring about how they're going to be represented. And I can also testify that there has been more public hearings from the time, well, when the census should have been released, let's say, until now than there was the previous time I went through this process. So I'm grateful for what you've done to um, allow more opportunities to early in the process, allow people to engage, and the promise that people will be able to draw maps and submit them through software that you all will be providing is a huge step forward as well. So just a note of thanks for that. And yet with all the progress that has been made so far, I'm obviously sitting here today because I feel there's still progress to be made. Um, and so, as lawmakers and administrators, I'm sure you can appreciate the importance of words and how words are defined. And in redistricting, it's interesting to note that it's not just the lines that matter, but words also matter in the redistricting process. And so before you have a copy of my written testimony, which I will go through, and then I'm happy to answer questions afterward, so just to start off, some um, key points that you'll hear in this testimony. Without a defined standard, it is impossible to uniformly evaluate legislative redistricting plans. Measurable standards with clear definitions are needed to safeguard the map drawing process. Five criteria form a solid foundation on which to build a redistricting plan. And it is essential to have transparency and clarity on how the criteria will be defined, prioritized, and balanced. So on page two of the testimony that you have before you are pictures of eight maps. And as you look at these maps, consider this question. Which map is the best map? Which map should be approved? And as you consider that question, the conclusion, of course, I came to, as you perhaps would as well, is the only way to answer that question is to have a standard. And then what should the standard be? There are some current rules in Pennsylvania regarding state legislative redistricting, which you all, I'm sure, are well aware of. There are the federal standards regarding equal population, which for state districts mean that each district has to be with an overall range of 10%, although higher overall ranges are allowed, but those must be justified. And then, of course, the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination against minorities. And then in Pennsylvania, we also have our constitutional requirements, which you all are intimately familiar with, of equal population, compact, contiguous, and preserving jurisdictional boundaries. These foundational rules still leave many key decisions at the discretion of those creating and finalizing state legislative district plans. For example, decisions which have the greatest impact 
on the final map include overall population range, that's the difference between the largest and smallest district, definition of map criteria, such as the rules above, and the starting map used, whether you use a blank map or whether you begin with the cores of prior districts. So how does the Legislative Reapportionment Commission create a defensible district plans which will respect the people and stand up in court? And I suggest that this is achieved by having a measurable standard that is clearly defined. And while standards exist for state legislative district plans, the definition of these standards can be the subject of debate. So consider the following scenario in the current legislative plans. And the standard that I'm referring to here is contiguous territories. But then look at the sample results from the current house map that's approved. And I have a picture illustrating those two. And the question is, are these districts contiguous? Because of perceived variances between the stated goals and the drawn districts, it raises the question as to the meaning of existing federal and state standards. So at the end of the day, there is still the need for resolution to the underlying issue of a redistricting process that lacks firm and measurable standards. So there are traditional, five essential traditional redistricting criteria which are generally accepted and are included in our Pennsylvania Constitution, which we've mentioned already about respecting minorities, equal population, preserving political subdivision boundaries, contiguous and compact. And the question is how these criteria will interplay with each other, especially if they're in conflict. So I would recommend that instead of attempting to gain agreement around a multitude of possible additional criteria, focus first on following these five essential priorities in 2021. Consider investing energies and resources into creating clearly defined and measurable standards based on the required criteria for the 2021 state legislative redistricting process, because these will protect the voice of the people. So what are characteristics of better redistricting criteria and definitions? And I suggest that there are four. Clear objectives, they need to be easily understood. Limited criteria, while focusing on one creates imbalance, focusing on too many will create confusion. Transparent priorities, so if two criteria are in conflict, which will gain precedence, for instance. And enforceable outcomes, because they need to be specific enough to withstand legal interpretation. So I'll conclude by giving some suggested definitions for some measurable standards that for your consideration as you move forward in this process. And the first one was, would be to use the highest overall range allowed, at least 10%. A higher overall range provides the best opportunity to balance the essential criteria in the legislative redistricting process. For example, if 10% had been used in 2011, Dauphin County would not have had to been divided in the Senate, and Carbon County in the House could have remained whole. And so the overall range you use has a significant impact on which counties and municipalities ultimately, just by virtue of their population, will be able to remain whole. So using the highest overall range possible really maximizes that benefit for others. Um, and it's not uncommon. So if you look at other states in 2010, 27 states had an overall range above 8%. Um, that's 54% of the states, and I have a list at the end if you're interested in more detail. Secondly, I recommend you affirm that the only reason a jurisdiction may be divided is because of population and the Voting Rights Act. The two standards most often connected are population equality and preserving jurisdictions. The minutes of the 1968 Constitutional Convention recorded the same rationale when introducing the current constitutional provision. They stated that divisions were only to be permitted to stay within the overall population range. And more recently, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court articulated this view 
when they wrote in a similar case that political subdivisions were not to be divided unless needed for equality of population. Over 90% of the discretionary jurisdictional divisions in the current Senate plan could have been avoided, as well as over 76% in the current House plan. And this criterion is of long-standing value in Pennsylvania. It has been present in every Pennsylvania Constitution since 1790. Thirdly, no voting precinct should be divided in forming a legislative district. And in the current plans, there are divisions like that. And there's perhaps no division more confusing to a voter and costly to the state than one made to the voting precinct. Fourth would be to first try to respect both minorities and the place where they live. So many times a VRA district can be created without dividing a jurisdiction. So for example, ward divisions in Allentown, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Reading might have been eliminated or reduced by over 60% and still provided a minority district. We should give minority group the benefit of not only being unified as a minority, but also in the place where they live. Fifth, allow small jurisdictional enclaves to be considered contiguous with their jurisdiction. So those are when a portion of the jurisdiction is surrounded by another jurisdiction at an equivalent government level. And these small geographic anomalies in Pennsylvania should not necessitate jurisdictional divisions. Six, do not attempt to define a specific measurement for compactness. Should a jurisdiction be divided just so the district improves a compactness score? I suggest the places people live seem to matter more than the ultimate shape of the district. Seven, do not consider school districts at the expense of other jurisdictions. Oftentimes, school districts are suggested as a boundary worth following in drawing district lines. And while this may be a valuable consideration, the boundaries of school districts do not always coincide with county or municipal boundaries, which are covered by the Constitution. So if they are to be considered, it should be a secondary consideration. And then in conclusion, just a couple process suggestions. Instead of working from existing district boundaries, consider starting from a blank map without consideration of district numbers. And then second, if secondary criteria will be used, focus first on achieving those primary objectives, those five essential um, criteria I mentioned earlier. And then if those secondary considerations are in conflict with the primary goal, the primary goal should be followed first and prevail. Secondary goals should never be achieved at the expense of the main objective. So in conclusion, it's critical that the Legislative Reapportion Commission, all of you, invest energies and resources into establishing clearly defined and measurable standards, and then using these standards in the 2021 legislative redistricting process. And while this is a challenging task, it would give you a solid basis to explain and defend the placement of district lines. You have the opportunity this year to leave a legacy of people before politics. And today can be the first step toward that legacy by supporting measurable standards with clear definitions in legislative redistricting. Thank you very much. Questions or comments for Ms. Holt? Representative Bradford. <clears throat> And, and I appreciate, I referenced earlier that I was one of those districts, so I, I very much appreciated you and Senator Costa's litigation. So uh, uh, let me ask you a couple questions about population deviation versus municipal splits. Um, as opposed to the first two witnesses, you definitely seem to be rightfully engaged on the problem with municipal splits. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I just ask you to kind of comment. Do you think it's fair to say that you've elevated the need to av avoid municipal splits in terms of the importance as opposed to as a willingness to blow out the population deviation to its furthest possible extent? I would say our Constitution does that. I mean, if you read back to the Constitutional Convention when they were first looking at this in 1968, 
they were talking about like 20% would be fine or 30% would be fine because the deviations at the time were so extraordinary. In congressional districts, they were like 100,000 persons different. I mean, so these were huge variances that today we'd look at and go, what were you thinking? That is so absurd. Like, how is that even like feasible? And so in the Constitutional Convention, they were like, okay, you know, we shouldn't do 100,000 people, like maybe 20% is fine. And it took about 10 years of case law, or maybe 20, because it was until the 1980s that they really kind of landed on, okay, this 10% is the sort of safe harbor, if you will, and we won't do that. Because the courts recognize that the census data isn't necessarily like 100% accurate down to the person. People are born and die every day. And that it's important to give some latitude in order to allow um, commissions like yourself to consider the values that are important to the state. And in Pennsylvania, a value that's important in our state and has always been important in our state is respecting these jurisdictional boundaries. And so yes, using that latitude in our Constitution, the way they constructed it, was designed to allow us to continue to respect those jurisdictional boundaries to the maximum extent possible without violating the Equal Protection Clause. And kind of building on that, what do you think, and I'm just asking for your opinion, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but what do you think is the advantage of that? What, what respecting municipal boundaries, what do you think we gain in that in terms of the equities, in terms of uh, the efficacy? What, what is the advantage of doing that? Pennsylvania can be somewhat unique in how we structure our government here compared to other states. There's a lot of power invested in municipalities that oftentimes in other states you'll find invested in counties. And so as they're making decisions and the boundaries of the municipalities don't change from year to year, um, in other states they can be a little more fluid. So they form to me a impartial boundary that one can look at and they do work together because they do form a community. I mean you've talked about communities of interest and these municipal boundaries do form a community because they're there advocating on behalf of like transportation needs for instance and other um, issues that they're facing and so by keeping these together it's not something that you're determining they're already predetermined boundaries and that they can be used then to um, like people think in terms of their places where they live for instance and where they come from and so it helps them to have a more unified voice and as I've gone around the state I've heard people mention that sometimes it can be difficult for their elected officials to advocate for funding that they need if they have to work with a lot of different people because they end up being such a minor portion perhaps of a district that they don't feel like they get a really strong say and that they can have issues related to bridges perhaps or other concerns that go unaddressed because you would think maybe having more people is better but they have found that less is more sometimes for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Leader Benninghoff. In a bipartisan manner, I'm going to uh, build a little bit on my good friend, Representative uh, Bradford's comments. Uh, we had the luxury of serving together in the Finance Committee, though we disagreed on times, we also agreed on times. But uh, I think he raises a very interesting contrast there with some of the other testifiers, and I was having the same thought in my mind. Because, you know, over the years and different discussions on redistricting the terminology of gerrymandering, a lot of people get caught up in pictures and the maps and this little um, bootleg over here, which on a map might look uh, disenfranchised from the municipality it actually is. But if you live in those municipalities, Pennsylvania has a tendency to be very parochial in our thought. Um, if you go into these small communities, regardless of their population size, they're very, very proud. And most of them have a lot of likeness in their ideologies and their thoughts and what they want for those communities. So I, I'm intrigued, uh, one, that you would elevate that and the fact that most Representative Bradford and I both picked that out. Uh, one thing I would encourage people to think about in a 10-year legislative cycle or probably redistricting cycle, some of these um, districts change dramatically. I mean, some of our districts will grow five, eight, even more thousands of people, but yet the legislator continues to serve who comes in to see them. So I've never been uh, 
know, one who says yes or no to serving somebody regarding some squiggly line. You come in, you need help, we help you out regardless. And uh, I think that's important for people to know. And the other part of that is the fact that we have 2,600 municipalities. We're not going to change that tonight, and we're not going to change that before we do the legislating process. So I do appreciate your emphasis on uh, the like-mindedness. I did have one quick question. Uh, you talked about um, overall ranges. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Do you think the general public or those of interest in this think that the lower the range of deviation somehow magically makes districts more equal? If their numbers are closer, is there a perception that may not necessarily actually be accurate, that they think it's more equal? I've encountered both views. So there are some who feel that districts should be exactly equal, like you should go down to zero, and that if there's any deviation that somehow that's harming an equal, like one person, one vote mentality. But then there are others that recognize and understand that um, people are born and die every day. And I find that more often than not, people are understanding of the higher population ranges and understanding um, Particularly, I've been testifying about congressional districts because they have a much um, narrower view right. in their field on that. That they um, would love to be in your position <laughs> of having a little more flexibility. And those that have testified have spoken to that, that that flexibility is helpful, especially if it's used to follow these kind of clear guidelines that are in the Constitution, that you're really using the overall population range to like minimize divisions to the places where they live and working to keep these places together. Yeah, I've always thought that reducing the number of the splits probably is more justified than worrying about a particular caveat that's added to the side of a district if you keep that municipality or particular jurisdiction whole. So I appreciate your candor on that and all the hard work you've put into that. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all.